have you abandoned? Are you still there? We're hoping and we're waiting. The world that you created is in despair. There's war and violence everywhere. Restore in us a new mind when hatred seems to come. Create in us a pure heart and let your kingdom come. Executive Minister of Love, Mercy, Do Justice for the Evangelical Covenant Church. Thank you for responding to Solidarity's call. Practicing solidarity is the sixth P of our sixfold test. And it asks us, how are we sharing in the suffering of others on both an individual and communal level? Our nation finds itself in yet another iteration of a long series of heartbreaking experiences related to racial injustice. This latest one, sparked by the murder of George Floyd, is disturbing and painful. And yet we are not without hope. This is also a moment for us to stand in solidarity for biblical justice and with those who continue to suffer in its absence. Today's expression will include voices from across our covenant family that reflects the power of our mosaic and the hope we have in the gospel to free us from the sin of racism. Join us as we reflect, as we repent, as we confess and lament and also respond. At the, at the end of our time, we will share a number of resources that have been curated to help you take action and to respond. As this is a time for us to transform our pain into problem solving. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, 
we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together to stand in solidarity with your word, with justice, and with those who are suffering. We pray that this conversation would catalyze action all across the ECC and beyond to work for what's right, to work to dismantle injustice and oppression in all its forms. Lord, we give this time back to you and we pray that you're glorified in all that we do and say. And Lord, we lift up the family of George Floyd and a country that's mourning his loss and the devastation that this brings to his family and to so many others. So bless us, God. Give us strength. And we pray that you have your way in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Thank God. Amen. God bless you. We are committed to justice and mercy because God himself is committed to justice and mercy. He tells us through the prophet Micah, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. In the covenant, we seek to love mercy and do justice, not to be politically correct, but to be biblically responsive. We believe in the whole gospel, proclaiming and demonstrating the love of Jesus. We also believe that justice, righteousness, and mercy are the foundations of God's shalom. This shalom is best expressed in the beautiful mosaic kingdom table where people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation are welcome. We also believe that every human being is created in the image of God and therefore has dignity and worth. I am calling on all my white brothers and sisters not to be silent, but to stand up and practice solidarity in word and deed. One of my friends sent me this quote, injustice for our black brothers and sisters is not their fight to bear, it's ours. My name is Avalon Johnson. I serve as one of the leaders of Crescendo a ministry focused on boomers and beyond. When I heard about the killing of George Floyd, I immediately responded in thinking, no, no. Another black unarmed man killed by the police? And so I settled in watching the news and watching the video, at least as much of it as I could watch. And as I watched that video, anger just started to boil within me. Anger at that which I was observing, recognizing that This was just one incident, but there had been many others. There were flashbacks of pictures that I had seen of lynchings where people gathered and looked on as someone was killed. I recognized that that anger was really not only at those that were there or those I'd seen in pictures, but at myself, a participant in the process that has gone on for now almost 401 years. First it was in chains on ships, then it was on a sail block, tearing apart families, then the bondage of slavery, only to be freed, to be then really exposed to new laws and policies that restricted again. And then the lynchings, 
the ongoing processes of arrest, as well as just how we participated in other inequities. So that anger was real. I also felt a deep sense of pain, pain in relation to what I knew was anguish being experienced by my sisters who are grandmothers and mothers of black males. How long, O oh Lord, how long? Hey Covenant family, my name is David Swanson. I'm the pastor of New Community Covenant Church here in Bronzeville on the near south side of Chicago. Uh, as to what I felt when I first learned of uh, the murder of George Floyd, when I first saw the videos, uh, I felt tremendous uh, sadness and grief. Uh, I, f I felt um, borderline despair, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I think, I think that was mostly it. Uh, profound grief, uh, lament, sadness, uh, just a kind of bodily ache uh, was, that was it. Uh, and then as a pastor, uh, thinking about um, how best to lead and care for our congregation, as well as our community uh, in response to, uh, to such a public, um, event of, of racial terror. Gracious Father, we pray to you with a cloud of grief and sorrow over our heads. We have witnessed countless people senselessly murdered due to racial violence. These people have families and we stand with them today in their pain. We lift them up to you now and we ask that you would surround them, Lord, with your presence. Care for them with your tender hands of comfort and joy. We lift up George Floyd's family to you, and we ask that you exchange their despair with your hope. Lord, as the church, as the body of Christ, we confess that we have been ignorant or uninterested or silent for too long. You've shown us what is good and what you require of us to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you, God. Yet we have failed time and time again to pursue racial righteousness and racial reconciliation. So humble us, O oh God. Forgive us, O oh God. Have mercy on us, O oh God. I pray for a new wave of justice and repentance and unity to flow within our churches. Like a mighty river, may true compassion flow through our veins. We declare that you are our help and our strength and our refuge in this time of trouble. So hear our lament, sovereign God. Yes, our hearts are faint and our knees tremble our bodies quake and our faces grow pale. Our eyes are spent from weeping and our stomachs churn. So come to our help and redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. God of our salvation, by the power of the cross through which you redeemed the world, bring to an end this hostility and establish justice. Through Christ we pray, amen. Being a racist, ignoring racism, or living in the comfort of my whiteness isn't something that I learned as an adult. The seeds are planted when we're children, either by what we've been told or not told, or through our actions or the actions of our family, or who we invite or don't invite into our lives. But either way, it leads to a continuing culture of racism and injustice in our country and in our lives. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way that they should go, and they will not turn from it. But what is the way? Jesus treated the marginalized with love and respect. He spoke to racism against the Samaritans and identified them as neighbors, and he admonished leaders who bent laws to favor themselves while others suffered. Jesus demonstrated that apathy leads to ignorance and injustice. Real change only comes when I decide to follow Christ's example and teach our children by what I do as well as by what I say. To be willing to live in the tension and yes, even the fear 
that our black brothers and sisters live in every day. Also to listen and to work together to bring about change. I wouldn't have been able to share any of these things were it not for my black brothers and sisters who have faithfully walked beside me for over 20 years. My faith is deeper, my understanding of the gospel is greater, and my life is fuller because of you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for our black brothers and sisters. Thank you, God, for creating a diverse world and calling it good. Thank you for reminding us through your son, Jesus Christ, that we are called to love one another, to care for one another, to walk beside each other. Lord, I lament and I ask for forgiveness for not having been more steadfastly standing with my brothers and sisters who are hurting, that I have not done all that I could to bring about the change that's needed, both within the church and within our country. Help us, I pray, as a nation to come together as one people, as you desire. Help us, Lord, as a church to set the example for our nation. Help us, God, to be good listeners of our brothers and sisters who are struggling and who are trapped by a system of injustice. Help us instead, Lord, to bring about the change that you desire. And Lord, we know that by the power and the presence of your spirit and by a willingness to truly walk together, that you can bring about the change that we seek. God, we give you thanks and I give you thanks for brothers and sisters who have walked beside me, who have helped me to grow in my own faith. Now, Lord, give me the strength to walk beside them as well in these difficult days and in the journey that we still have that lies before us. For all of these things, we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi everyone, this is Dave Kirsten. I'm the Dean at North Park Theological Seminary in Chicago, which is the Evangelical Covenants Seminary. We're part of North Park University on the north side of Chicago. Uh, we serve the whole church. Um, I, uh, I've been there for eight years and um, I've been a covenant pastor. I've been ordained since 1982. So I've been doing this a long time, been in denominational leadership, led several congregations, which was my joy and my, my deep life calling to be present to people in that way. And, uh, but it's my honor and privilege to be with you in this service of confession, of lament, and of a call to action in this critical time in our country and in our church. So would you join me? Would you join me in prayer? Loving and gracious God, we are before you. We are before you in this, this time of crisis, in, this, in this, this moment of deep, deep brokenness, national brokenness, and, and brokenness that fractures the church. And, and God, we, we name it. We, we, we come before you and we, we name that we know where this comes from. There's a 400 year history, beginning with chattel slavery and the exploitation of black people, of African people, forcibly dragging them here to this country for economic gain. And God, we name that, we name our history. We name that deep 
brokenness, that, that othering of people, that subjugating of people, that, that making them less than human so we could exploit them for our own gain. We have a history. We have a, a rich and varied history, but this, this is our history. And it shows up now. And it comes now. It, it comes in, in so many ways in our, in our current society. And we, we name that and we lament it before you right now. Uh, we, we name, we name that, that, uh, that, that our country was built on the back of slave labor. And, and that many of the advantages that the dominant culture has, that, that white people in the society have, comes because of that. We own it, we name it, and, and God, we, we own further that as that history has come forward, it has led to economic disparities that are, that are tragic, and that this current pandemic and this current health crisis has ripped open and uncovered in, in deeper and fresh ways. That, that people of color and that black people in particular don't have access to health care, don't, don't in, in, in fair ways, don't, don't have access to employment, are not paid fairly. 73 cents on the dollar. They are the last hired and the first fired when there's any crisis. God, we, we own this and we name it. We, we name... Uh, we name a criminal justice system which to attach the word justice to what we do in mass incarceration is wrong. There's nothing just about it. We incarcerate black and brown bodies at an excessive rate and we exploit them further. And, and, and God, this is so profoundly wrong and so deep wrong and lives and families and children are, are broken and devastated by this. We name it God, we confess it and, and beyond lament we, we want to begin to dismantle it. We want to dismantle an unfair economic system. We want to dismantle an unfair educational system. We want to dismantle an unfair, an unfair criminal justice system, God. But most, God, we confess that this is all driven, driven by a deep set institutional racism. And in that, God, we, we confess our complicity with that that we as white people, as white Christians, we, we name that we've done far too little. We've been silent and our silence has, has empowered violence against people. And that brings the crisis of today. And so God, we, we confess this, we name it, we call it out, but more God, more, more than, more than confession, more than lament, more than our guilt and our shame and our complicity in this. We hear you, God. We hear the deep call to action in this time that we have to dismantle racism, that we have to become uh, institutions and churches that are anti-racist and dismantling the systems of racism, that we're going to do that hard work, that we're going to, that we're going to set the resources available to do that, that we're going to, we're going to commit ourselves to, to the hard work of dismantling racism, that, that, we, that our institutions, our school, our university, and our seminary must become anti-racist institutions. Our denomination, our denominational offices, our regional conferences, the, the whole of us, our local congregations, have to declare that they are anti-racist and that they will dismantle. They will take the steps, the hard work. We will name it, we will call it out, but we will begin the endeavor now 
to share power, to rewrite narratives, to, to, to begin to do this deep intrinsic work. So God, I, I ask that you hear us, that you hear certainly our confession, that you hear our lament, but that you empower and that you embolden and that you grant us the courage to do this work of dismantling. To that end, we pray. We pray in the name and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. In the 15th century, there was a series of papal bulls that became known as the Doctrine of Discovery. This was both a theological doctrine and a political doctrine. The theological aspects of the Doctrine of Discovery was the statement and the declaration that European bodies held more value than non-European bodies. Europeans were made more in the image of God than, say, those they encountered in Africa and those they encountered in the Americas. That kind of theological dysfunction and that kind of theological misstatement led, of course, to a profound political and geopolitical implication. It meant the decimation and the genocide of the Native community in the Americas, a continent that had once seen six million lives and 2,000 unique civilizations dwindle down to several hundred thousand in the 20th century. The decimation of the Native community could not have occurred unless the Christian community, the church, the Christian leaders sanctioned it with a theological dysfunctional doctrine. What we have seen throughout the course of American history is the way that the conquest, the destruction, and the decimation and the genocide of the Native community can oftentimes be attributed to a horrible, diseased imagination in the church that got carried over into our society. The concepts of manifest destiny, the concept of kill the savage but save the man, the concept of, of taking this European nation from sea to shining sea, these were all theological concepts that were used for the death and destruction of the native community. We must enter into profound lament to cry out to God and plead forgiveness that the church, that the body of Christ, that the Christian community contributed to the genocide of the native community, that the Christian believers offered up a severely diseased and dysfunctional imagination and theology that led to the death of millions of native lives. If we are going to be the church, we must declare that these bodies matter, that these souls matter, and that we are culpable for the sin of genocide. All too often we have oppressed, marginalized, and turned our backs on our Latino brothers and sisters. How have we turned our backs? We've treated our brothers and sisters as them and not us. The dividing wall of hostility was destroyed across in the empty tomb, but the workers are many who actively rebuild the dividing wall day after day. How have we turned our backs? We've responded to their thoughts, their stories, and their lives with, yeah, but. Yeah, but what about our jobs? Yeah, but what if they hurt someone? Yeah, but where will they live? Yeah, but the police didn't mean it. Yeah, but they need to learn English. Yeah, but. How have we turned our backs? Systems have been created where Latino men are four times more likely to go to jail than white men. Families are separated. We turn our backs when we ignore the plight that forces a man and his 12-year-old boy to travel some of the most dangerous parts of our world from Nicaragua to Tijuana, hoping they can come into our country, only to be turned away with nowhere to go. How have we turned our backs? We turned our backs simply by being good white people we don't actively harm. We don't go out of our way to maim. We don't go out of our way to hate or to hurt, but we're simply good. And so we don't go out of our way to listen to. We don't go out of our way to stand with. And we definitely don't go out of our way to follow where they lead. How have we turned our back? We have a failure of imagination. Our imagination is alive and well, but it is broken and it is messed up. 
It was messed up when I thought Jose, a boy in my seventh grade class, must have been in a gang because he was Mexican. Our imagination is messed up and we told the 19-year-old college freshman to go back to where she came from when she had spent her whole life in the States. Our imagination is messed up when a Mexican-American man who served two tours in Vietnam is deported after being falsely charged with a crime and there's no way he will ever step foot in our country again. But he's allowed to come back in a casket to rest at Arlington. We've turned our back. But this is the season of Pentecost. The good news of Pentecost is that the Holy Spirit can reshape and reform us. In the power of the Holy Spirit, there is no more them, only us. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't have to say, yeah, but anymore. We simply say, yeah. In the power of the Spirit, we, re we recreate systems so that all are free. In the power of the Spirit, we stop being good white people and instead we actively, actively stand with all God's people. In the power of the Spirit, our imaginations are remade, not with me at the center, but with Jesus right in the middle. God, we continually turn our back to you. We continually turn our back to brothers and sisters. Give us the courage now to turn to you and to each other, for you have never turned your back on us. Father, I cry out to you on behalf of my Latino sisters and brothers, family members who often feel invisible, left out, overlooked, and taken for granted. Father, you are the God who sees, and I thank you, God, that you see whom you have created, and it is good, very good. Thank you for all the ways in which you are using my Latino sisters and brothers to bless and bring revival to the Evangelical Covenant Church. I lament the ways in which my sisters and brothers have been neglected, shut down, and put down. Forgive us as a church for not doing more to advocate for immigration reform. Continue to raise up people who will speak truth to power. Father, Please bring vindication and hope in Christ for our sisters and brothers. Amen. As the body of Christ, we must confess that we have not faithfully loved our Asian American sisters and brothers. Instead of choosing to stand in solidarity with them, all too often we have stood silently by as they have been dehumanized and exploited by systemic sin and institutional racism. As anti-Asian sentiments spread like wildfire throughout the West Coast, ultimately leading to the Chinese Exclusionary Act, where was the body of Christ? Where were their brothers and sisters? As that act was expanded for the course of 60 years, where was the witness of the church? When we think about uh, when we think about uh, racial violence, purging, and exclusion from communities, all too often we think about just indigenous people and African Americans, but this is the experience of our Asian American brothers and sisters in this country too. The Chinese, for example, were driven out, forcefully driven out of over 40 cities throughout our country. Where was the witness of the church? as the Japanese were scapegoated and ultimately forced into incarceration camps. Where was the body of Christ as over 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry were rounded up, stripped from their land, separated from their family, divorced from their, uh, their possessions and everything that they had ever known, called enemies, labeled terrorists, and forced into a carceral state without even having the benefit of due process. The church was either silent all too often or actively fanning the flames of xenophobic violence. We must confess, we must lament, we must acknowledge the ways in which we have been complicit with our Asian American brothers' history of violence and suffering in this nation. And I call us to this confession as an African American, acknowledging the ways in which systemic sin and um, institutional racism blinds 
people of color from seeing the ways in which we're commonly oppressed. It leads us and seduces us to seeing our neighbors of color as competition for the spoils of empire. See, the empire is predicated upon our unwillingness, our inability to stand in solidarity with one another. And I confess that as African-American, we all too often have participated in uh, perpetuating Asian Americans as perpetual foreigners. We all too often have been complicit with uh, their economic exploitation uh, through the destruction of property during riots. My name is Michelle Clifton Soderstrom, and I am Interim Dean of Faculty at North Park Theological Seminary and Professor of Theology and Ethics. Please join me now in a time of lament for sins of racism against Asian Americans. God of the nations, we have invaded your inheritance. We've defiled your holy temple and reduced your cities to rubble. In the wake of George Floyd's murder and the killing of countless other black and brown people, we confess that none escape the destructive impact of systemic racism. We have allowed racism to grow in our nation and to establish a foothold in our churches. And we name the ways we have harmed our brothers and sisters of Asian descent. We lament our history of culturally and legally dismantling Asian families and the hundreds of anti-Asian legislations in US history. We name the Chinese American Exclusion Act of 1882, the Oriental Exclusion Act of 1924, the juvenile delinquency panic of the 1950s. We name the treatment of Korean women as prostitutes and war brides and the stigmatization against Korean children fathered by white American servicemen. We confess the failure of white Christian families adopting Asian children to engage the history of colonization and war. Lord, pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Lord, we lament the logic of Orientalism and war as a pillar of white supremacy. We repent of US colonial rule in the islands. We confess our discrimination and anti-Asian bias during wars against Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. We weep in the face of decades of violence against Filipino American laborers in California. Forgive us, Lord, for forcing Japanese men to fight in the U.S. military to prove their loyalty and for then incarcerating them and many other Japanese persons in war internment camps. We grieve, Lord, our complicity in using countries across Asia as battlegrounds for anti-communist wars and anti-China ideologies. May the Lord silence all flattering lips and every boastful tongue. Those who say, by our tongues we will prevail, our own lips will defend us. Who is Lord over us? We repent for not recognizing the contagion of anti-Asian racism, xenophobia, and hate crimes in this period of COVID. We recognize destructive language such as yellow peril and model minority and Chinese virus. Lord, your psalmist said that you have, we have left the dead bodies of your servants as food for the birds of the sky, the flesh of your own people for animals of the wild. They have poured out like blood, like water, all around Jerusalem, and there is no one to bury the dead. We cry to you for the reality that decades after fighting for the U.S. and over 50,000 deaths of Hmong men and boys, we have failed to protect Hmong in the Midwest against implicit and explicit racism. We are ashamed for publicly celebrating Chinese and Filipino healthcare female workers after SARS without seeing how they feared for their lives going home. We repent for the failure of allyship, including the blindness of we white women to call out inequities among women of Thai, Cambodian, Nepalese, Laotian, Hmong, and Burmese American descent who earn below 60 cents on the dollar of every white man. We expose the tactics of white Americans, including using Asian Americans to denigrate African Americans 
and including Asian Americans as a tool to undermine the activists of African and Native peoples. Because the poor are plundered and the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. Lord, we recognize you as Lord of the nations and head of the church. We give this prayer of confession and lament to you so that you may respond with your refiner's fire. Give us the courage to recommit ourselves our communities, and our churches to the work of racial righteousness. In your name we pray. Amen. My name is Pastor Luke Swanson. I've been the pastor of Community Covenant Church for the last 17 years, pastor in, in North Minneapolis. Uh, North Minneapolis is a historic African-American neighborhood uh, that has a long history of uh, political and economic neglect. Uh, I've seen, uh, had an up... Uh, front row seat to a lot of injustice through the years, uh, and my heart breaks. Um, but uh, this past week, our neighborhoods have been under attack. And in all the injustices that I've seen, never did I think that I would see uh, armed white people with swastikas on their arms, uh, wreaking havoc in my neighborhood um, and tearing down businesses. Uh, never did I think that I would be afraid in my own home. In the wake of the events of this past week, following the death of George Floyd, my wife and I in conversation both confessed the, the desire for things to get back to normal. But the de death of George Floyd reminds us that things can never go back to normal. The mayor of, of St. Paul, Mayor Carter, said that we are living in a post-George Floyd world. If James Baldwin says that to be black in America is to live in a constant state of rage, then I say to be white in America is to desperately cling to the hope that things will return to normal. And, and I'm not saying that we don't recognize and acknowledge the tragic events in history. It's just that when we are confronted with an unrelenting stream of racial tragedy, we say, this is not who we are. The inclination of white America is certainly to grieve and to brush ourselves off, but then to get back to the real America. But I have discovered that the lies and the myths and illusions that have shaped me, that have shaped us, desperately try to shield us from the truth that white supremacy is the real America. And whether it is COVID or the, uh, and its disproportional impact on the black community, uh, or the death of Ahmad Arb Arb Arbery, um, the death of Brianna Taylor, or the death of George Floyd. Once again, we can plainly see that racism and hate has not abated, but has metastasized. We are living in a post-George Floyd world, and gone are the days when white communities can just deflect and say things like, don't get all political, just stick to the gospel. You see, there is a powerful policing that takes place that reacts violently when anyone courageously names the corporate sin of racism. It's a way to disconnect ourselves with the suffering of the world. But we are here to, now to stand in solidarity. And solidarity begins with confession. The cross, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ was an act of solidarity. Jesus came only armed with a psalm that said, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Here you see in the forsaken places, the places where we have abandoned our humanity and we have been abandoned by the government, abandoned by the empire, God has centered himself in the forsaken places. God has centered himself with those who suffer. And the church too must center ourselves now in a post-George Floyd world. We must center ourselves in the forsaken places. Let us pray. Oh, great burden bearer, Lord God, we need you. Grief right now is raw and our city is in pain. Our city cannot breathe. 
Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Lord God, as a white leader, I confess my sin that has blinded me to the trauma of my brothers and sisters. As I know you can do, Holy Spirit of the living God, do me over and make me brand new. We turn to you in the hour of our need and we, we ask for courage. We ask for courage to name the corporate sin of racism and, and also the discernment to, to know how to fight in both the spiritual realms and strategically against a corrupt system that reacts violently when resisted. Holy Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Amen. So the question before us is, how can white people respond now? I sense we're at a crossroads, and there's a stop sign. We've been at this crossroads before, and there have been stop signs. But I encourage us to not do a rolling stop, but to stop, look, and listen. There is no formula, no one right way. I can share with you what's helpful to me. Being reminded of Second Chronicles 7, 14 has been very helpful, particularly to me and my still stay-at-home status. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. Humble ourselves. This is not a time to be know-it-alls. This is a time to be learn-it-alls. Access the many books and videos and films. Gather small group of persons within your sphere of influence. Access those resources, discuss them, pray together, discern how it is that you can be not only white allies for people of color, but how can you be advocates? for the change that can make a difference so that we don't keep revisiting this intersection. To the question then about what we as white people and white Christians can do, I wanna suggest uh, three, three steps. First is repent. Um, the racial uh, terror, the racism, the visible white supremacy that we see all around us right now has existed for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And Christians of color, and particularly black Christians, have testified to that reality um, forever. And those of us who are white have ignored it, have not believed it, have turned away. And so we, we begin with repentance. Um, the second thing is responsibility. Uh, we do not um, wallow in guilt or shame, though we do have things to be ashamed about. But we don't allow a moment like this to become about us. We choose not to center our own emotional response right now, but rather to take responsibility for our actions and for the actions of the white communities to which we belong. And so taking responsibility means uh, owning those places of influence and credibility, owning the ways in which we have privilege, and then choosing to take responsibility for that. Uh, in order to stand in solidarity, uh, in order to advocate in material ways uh, for black and brown people, particularly in this moment. And then finally, repair. Uh, we look for opportunities to join communities of color, particularly black communities in this moment, in repairing what we have, um, what we have damaged. There's already good work of repair happening all around us. There's already amazing leaders doing amazing things, communities that have been committed to repairing 
uh, broken systems, uh, unjust systems, deceptive narratives for generations. We don't need to start new things at this point. We can humbly look for opportunities to join in the repair that uh, sisters and brothers have already been leading uh, and join them in that work. Just as God has not called us into this work in and of our own strength and left us to fend for ourselves, but has entrusted us with the gift of the Holy Spirit, we as a denomination are not calling our members into this work, into this practice of solidarity um, and abandoning you to yourselves. We have curated a plethora of resources to empower you to love your neighbor well, to understand the history of oppression and injustice that has cultivated the disparities that have been normalized in our nation. We have created resources from children's ministry to singers that are really giving us a vision for what does it mean to practice and pursue racial righteousness in a way that leads to solidarity. And so uh, there is a resource that is really framing how we engage and respond to the killing of our brother George Floyd. Uh, it gives you an in-depth analysis and historic perspective of the African-American experience and the systemic injustices and oppressions that have led to some of the disparities that we are seeing made manifest through this uh, pandemic right now of COVID, but also some of the ways in which we can understand this incident of police brutality and racial violence as just the latest articulation of an elongated history. Uh, we also have um, resources to start the conversation earlier because one of the things that we have realized is that neuroscientists have said that the racial associations that a child has by the age of seven will ultimately dictate their interaction with race for the rest of their lives. So we realized that we needed to um, reframe our discipleship paradigm that allows our kids to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to respond to injustice. So we have the Justice Journey for Kids curriculum that's also available for you. We also have the Invitation to Racial Righteousness, which is a two-day, a day-and-a-half experience where we have trained facilitators come out to your congregation and lay the biblical theological foundation for racial righteousness and really articulate why this is an optional add-on to the gospel, but a, it's a core component of following Jesus in a divided world. And so we offer up these resources and we commit to walking alongside of you as we collectively exercise this new muscle of standing in solidarity with one another and choosing to show the love of Christ in the face of evil and oppression that abounds all too often with the church being complicit. We as the Evangelical Covenant Church commit ourselves to standing in solidarity with one another in the face of evil and showing the world that we are Christ's disciples by the way that we sacrificially love one another. On Honey Wash Day, Hamataki Oyasin, TJ Smith and Manchia P. Malakota Dakota Nakota Oyate. I'm the pastor of New Song Covenant Church in Anchorage, Alaska. I'm Lakota, and I'm the president of the Indigenous Ministers Association of the Mosaic Commission in the ECC. Wichikie, let's pray. And the CEV Galatians 3.28 says, Faith in Christ Jesus is what makes each of you equal with each other. Whether you are Jew or Greek, a slave or a free person, a man or a woman, we have not been equal. The founding of the United States in our constitutional documents, African Americans were counted as three-fifths humans, and indigenous people were merciless savages. We see that same wind continue to blow today. We are on the same trail that has been, we've been on for many centuries, and the trail has widened to include more than just African Americans and indigenous people. Even as we are called the daughters and sons of the Creator, we are not equal. We are broken. We are hurting. 
we are being divided. And in being divided, it hurts all of us. My prayer for us is a covenant for us as people in my language. Unchi maka wageha he oyate wageha he chunte deke matakia hasape oyasen yazon onikia okiyote oyate okanta ka pohan Chunte oyote opila. Chese kyun ate yapi nanchin chana waniya wakan emchatu.